mm, kind of the same size as Phoebe, but she's a little chunky right now, so she needs to lose some weight. Um, okay, I think we're live. Yes, we are. Okay, cool. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our next live chat here in the Small Breed Dog Training Group. Sorry about being late. I had scheduling conflict got all over the place, lost track of time. Um, but we're here now and we're ready to talk to you guys. Um, today I have Veronica here who is going to talk to us about Orbit, who is obviously making a wonderful guest appearance already. And I love him so much from afar. I've never met him, but I do love him a lot. Um, and so today we're just going to talk about kind of the general topic of how Veronica went about raising Orbit. He turned out to be kind of a unique dog in terms of behavioral support that he needed whenever he grew. Um, and that started, I'm pretty sure, like quickly from day one, right? Like you kind of noticed that he needed a little bit more help than like a normal puppy raising situation. Um, so to start us out, can you tell us just a little bit about Orbit in general? Yeah, Orbit is a toy fox terrier. Um, and so they're a great breed because it's a mix of like a companion lap dog, like a toy, and then like terrier, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so the tenacity yeah. and prey drive. And he's like 21 months old, so he's almost two mm -hmm. in November. And He's a funny little dog. You know, he does have a big heart with all of his issues, but he's also extremely like athletic and smart mm -hmm. and quick and, you know, training him is really fun. <laughs> he looks like a lot of fun to me. Like just from the little clips that you post and stuff, it seems like he just like really enjoys training, which is something that I really want in my next dog. So, um, toy fox terriers are not off my list. They're not, you know, I'm not going to make any commitments here where anybody's keeping track, but they're not off my list. Um, so whenever you initially brought Orbit home as a puppy, did you kind of notice any kind of particular signs that indicated he might need more support as he grew up other than just like traditional puppy socialization, let them play with other puppies, let them meet people and go a bunch of places, right? Um, what were the kind of signs that you noticed from him that he may need a little bit more than that? Well, right away, you know, walking into it, I didn't know he was going to be a little bit different. He yeah. was noted as a shy puppy. And okay. I, for some reason, have a soft spot for shy puppies. Mm -hmm. They're always my favorite in puppy class, and I'm so drawn to them. And Ben, my late dog, was a shy dog, and I just I have a soft spot for them. So I knew he was going to be a little different and have different needs. I didn't mm -hmm. really know entirely what I was getting into. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, unfortunately, as you never do, yeah. yeah. <laughs> reactive, but he was like reactive right away. Like day three, I really saw like barking, snarling, lunging, like this like strong little ball of a thirteen week old puppy who was just yeah. so was thirteen weeks, so yeah, scared and uh -huh. so intense. So like I knew right away that it was going to be different, and then three days in, like just what mm -hmm. I'd be up against. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you kind of noticed that, like, did you notice any kind of different behavior from him, like around the house or anything as well? Or was it more so just kind of like the, the shyness was more than you thought it was going to be? Yeah, around the house. I mean, he, um, he kind of like had a wall up. He was mm -hmm. a little bit of a guarded puppy. Um, not terribly, you know, bonding with him has been different. Yeah. But, you know, he could be um, sometimes like a serious puppy, so not always just like goofy and playful yeah. and floppy. Although he did exhibit a does. lot of those behaviors. Yeah. <laughs> it just, you know, I've been I've been around so many puppies that he was, you know, different, just more serious. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I, I know exactly what you mean. We have um a puppy in the household right now. So <laughs> and he's not even nine weeks and he's extremely goofy and floppy and doofy. So Yes. That sweetness. Um, so whenever you first got him and you were kind of thinking, you know, I need to get started, obviously, like you are extremely training savvy, like you're a CPD DKA, you know what you're doing. Um, but whenever you were kind of making your plan for him, did you initially enroll him in any kind of puppy classes? Was that something that you did? And did it go well? Did it not go so well? Is that something that you would normally kind of recommend for people who may have like fearful puppies or puppies who are showing signs of reactivity? So I did enroll him in puppy class. I enrolled yeah. him when I knew I was picking him up. So, you know, the timing of it, I had to get him into the soonest puppy class because worst case scenario, I can drop yeah. out. So yeah. I 
had already enrolled him in class. And then upon meeting him within the first week, mm -hmm. I decided to take him to class because although he was showing extreme fear of people, mm -hmm. Um, he loved dogs. I introduced him to a couple adult safe dogs and he yeah. wasn't guarded around them at all. It was like immediate, like, yes, like this. Is, <laughs> yeah. Fun. These are my best friends. Born, yeah. Born to do. We're going to be best friends. Um, so just based on that, I I knew that maybe I should try class because yeah. I could leave. I could go home. Um, yeah. you know, and it has to be the right class. So um we went to like a positive reinforcement puppy class that mm -hmm. had very small classes um i think there was only four other puppies in his class in this like giant space yeah that's um, so nice <laughs> yeah i yeah i always feel like puppy classes sometimes they get a little bit overwhelming if there's like a bunch of puppies in there and like you don't really get a whole lot of one-on-one -on -one time with the trainer so that's super nice sorry i don't mean to interrupt you yeah. <laughs> no, it, it, it was very nice it was very yeah. nice very small um they let me stay in class which is fantastic mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> did great in class yeah. honestly like he did a lot of sitting on my lap and observing which you know that was the only place he was able to do that he wasn't able to do that in any other environment because he'd just be like too overwhelmed yeah he played with his toys he chewed his bones he got to walk around the room and play with the dogs at the end so mm -hmm. I'd say it was a positive experience for Orby. He would yeah. react if someone left the room and came back. Um, yeah. Luckily, it didn't happen too much with not the, that many people in the room. So yeah. not that many people had to like leave and like go to their car, or go to the bathroom. So he wasn't reactive too much in class. But yeah. there, there were some moments, there were some side eyes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, of course. I always feel like that too, like, because I teach, um, I teach puppy classes now, like, just kind of on a general rotation. Um, and I always find that, like, especially, of course, the first day of group class in general, especially a puppy group class, like, I always set the stage for everybody, it's going to be chaos, like, don't yeah. expect anything less and don't be embarrassed. But I still always feel like sometimes people are like, Oh, they're being so bad. And I'm like, they, it's no, it's fine everything's fine. Like nobody's judging you. This is what we're here for. Um, but that's really nice. So you would say probably if, if you were seeing those kind of concerns with your puppy, like maybe looking for maybe a smaller, more low key class, if that's something that you wanted to do with them. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. As, as long as you go into it with an open mind that your yeah. puppy is going to be doing what the other puppies are doing, like you're there just to hang out and play yeah. with your um, all the other puppies are probably going to be doing sit down, stay, look at me, whatever. And Orby only did a small portion of that, yeah. like within class. Um, that was like not the point, right? Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't the point. Luckily, I yeah. know how to teach those things. I think it is hard when you don't know how to teach those things and you're there to learn how to teach your dog those things mm -hmm. when you're not in puppy school. And there might be trainers who feel like they can't help you and your puppy mm -hmm. in this class and they might want to refer you out or do private training, which is up to them because at the end of the yeah. day, puppy classes are for normal puppies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's kind of one of those things like go into it with an open mind, kind of see what they're doing, see kind of what their behavior is like. Are there anything like any kind of behaviors that you would say would be red flags that like maybe your puppy's not learning quality things in a puppy class like they may be too overwhelmed or the environment might be too hard for them where it's something that like oh i may need to consider kind of backing out of this or pivoting to a different style of training yeah i mean if they're not eating yeah <laughs> if they're not eating any food if they're not engaging with you um if they are sleeping the whole time because yeah dogs puppies stressed down and they just look like a sleepy puppy but it, your puppy might not be calm like if it's abnormally sleeping a lot in class <laughs> yeah like oh um, this is just too much i'm just gonna like i'm gonna be done with this I'm right. gonna shut down. <laughs> we're, we're kind of not here in my yeah life. um and if the class isn't run well where they're not like giving you options of a visual barrier or mm -hmm. like um you know, if your puppy is scared of the other puppies, there should be a barrier there. You know, the puppy playtime, if included, shouldn't be a free for all. So yeah, maybe consider if you really feel like it's hurting, like anything that you're doing, mm -hmm. if you feel like it's hurting your training progress, you should stop. <laughs> yeah, 
Okay. If it just feels wrong, it's probably, it's, wrong, it's, it's probably wrong. something that you can just kind of, you can opt out <laughs> of or decide that it's not for you. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So kind of going back to Orby specifically, uh, there were a couple, I feel like there were a lot of things that you did with him that wasn't necessarily like, Oh, I'm just going to teach him the basics. I'm going to teach him sit down, stay all of the things that we normally consider to be like, puppy training basic obedience right um he needed more support from you than that because you know he had this other stuff going on with his fear and with his reactivity and everything um so are there kind of a few different training approaches you want to mention that you used with him and you felt like they were really helpful for him as he kind of grew up to help develop his confidence mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so even teaching him things like sit and down mm -hmm. um he didn't like following a food lore he felt like okay. that was very icky and very although he had no problem chewing my yeah. hand when he was uh -huh. puppy, like he had he chewed my hands a lot when it was in a training setting he felt very conflicted about mm -hmm. food directly in my hand and like trying to follow it and he just didn't like it so okay. um the first few things that i taught him like one was just like find it like i need yeah. to put your head down when I say this, I need you to know it is like a reinforcement cue. Mm -hmm. And there's just so many uses for it. It's more than just throwing mm -hmm. food around arbitrarily. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so <laughs> I knew that he needed to be really, really good at find it. Um, and really, really good at kind of like walking into me, like using my body mm -hmm. as a lure. Like if I'm backing up, you, you need to be like walking towards Come me. Come with you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That's really, yeah. I like that a lot. Um, and like, what, when would you normally use that with him? Was that more so like if there were, if you guys were encountering something that you knew was going to stress him out or was it more so for anything else? Um, yeah. So a lot for management. So instead yeah. of teaching him basics, cause I mean, he may or may not know sit at this time. He learned down. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, I, I did mean, that to me for a very long time. I, they probably still would, honestly. Right. <laughs> yeah. Down, but if I say sit, he might down. So yeah, whatever. Fine. So <laughs> I like, needed him to know a few key things that I could use to kind of bond with him, bridge communication, but also that yeah. was going to be super helpful in the real world as management. So, you know, a U-turn, name recognition, find uh -huh. it, um, picking him up. These were all used when we were avoiding reactions. Okay. And was he always comfortable? This is just a question that I'm wondering, like, was he always comfortable being picked up or did you have to do any kind of work with that too? I would say he never had a huge uncomfortable feeling about okay, it, cool. but, um, it, he probably didn't want to be picked up as much as I have to pick him up. So we, yeah. we have really worked on that in collar grabs and how I approach him. So I'm not just hovering over him like yeah. as a small dog in general yeah. and not just like grabbing just towards him. And right. Him so yeah. <laughs> I had to, yeah. I've put it on cue. He gets food every time for doing it still. Oh, cool. okay. um, so it's something we practice all the time because some people know he has a hard time going upstairs and mm -hmm. my house has stairs. So yeah. Being picked up is, is part of his normal life. I okay. will say that there was a time where on walks specifically, if I mm -hmm. picked him up to uh, manage him, he might avoid me for the rest of the walk. So we yeah. had to put okay. in a lot of work of him like trusting me or me even being on his radar, like yeah. and not just holding the leash because that was in the first few months of his life, a work all on its own where mm -hmm. there was quite a few walks where my friend was doing all the training. He was looking yeah. to them. They were doling out treats. I was holding the leash and he might look back at me and I could give him a treat, but it, it was really hard to even be on his periphery. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's really interesting. Like that's a, very unique approach to that too is just being like i'm gonna have somebody else handle him for a little bit like that's really smart though i really like that um okay so next question that we have for you was it only training that you feel like helped him or did you support him in other ways that you kind of feel are helpful which i feel like kind of goes off of what we've already started to touch on like you know just building up these management tactics and everything um and i know some people kind of have a little bit of a blurred line between like what's management and what's training, you know, because they, you know, cross over so much and mm -hmm. every dog is learning at any opportunity that you're presenting them with any of these situations. Um, but is there any other stuff that you did that you don't feel is like, oh, I'm going to teach him this like one, two, three step behavior, but you feel like it helped him a lot whenever it came to helping grow his confidence in his relationship to you? 
Yeah, I would say is the the non training things that we've been able to do. That yeah. Have been integral to the process and that I wouldn't have been able to have progress without. And one of them is mm -hmm. I put him on medication right away. Yeah. So okay. at five and a half months old, he was put on medication and we started trialing medications. I don't feel like we would have made any progress. Yeah. Without medication because his brain just was not okay and yeah. he was immediately over threshold you know life was an over threshold moment yeah. for him for a while and uh, there was there was no training there's only management and even management we were just scraping by so yeah <laughs> yeah huge advocate for it yeah <laughs> one of mine is on meds too so yep <laughs> and then um helper dogs he yeah. is a different dog when he's around helper dogs um almost every time we go anywhere outside of my yard he's with another dog and um he just has more confidence and i know surprisingly a lot of adult stable dogs who don't mind that orbit was a small dog a loud dog yeah. rude <laughs> yeah of course <laughs> all the things um all the things. Is that like, I mean, obviously that's like really wonderful that you have all of those people as a resource. Is that something that like, is there a general kind of list that you look for whenever you're looking for a helper dog? Is there anything like in particular that you would say is probably not good for somebody who wants to test if their like social dog would do better with another dog whenever they're taking them out and about? Yeah, so you need a dog who's maybe non-reactive themselves. Yeah. Although Orbit's main dog that he hangs out with can be reactive, but she's put a lot of work into mm -hmm. it where it's mostly resolved. Um, so, you know, a dog who is pretty level-headed, mm -hmm. um, goes out on a walk and just kind of is a dog, does a thing, smells things, pees yeah. on things. Mm -hmm. um, a There's dog, a lot of dog things, yeah. Right, does uh -huh. dog things, is pretty uh -huh. level-headed, doesn't mind other dogs, doesn't mm -hmm. take offense to um, like dogs who are, are going to bark or, yeah. um, they don't allow Orby to get in other dogs' faces, but yeah. you never know what can happen. And mm -hmm. Orby's small, so I can't have a dog who's going to um be unsafe around him like yeah. or all of a sudden like barks that other dog isn't going to like want to correct him mm -hmm. or uh push him or just become really weird because he's small so yeah. you just kind of need um like a four to five year old level-headed dog yeah. who <laughs> also, uh, is dog savvy so can be introduced to other dogs very easily yeah <laughs> That's, I mean, that's so nice to have. I also love that that's like his thing. He's like, I need my other emotional support dog to go with me and I can handle it. <laughs> yes. um, I think we have a question in the comments. So I'm going to put this on here. Can you talk about the emotional component of owning such a young puppy with behavioral issues and how to know when it's time to call in a professional? That's a really good question. Yeah, like the emotional component on the human side, I think maybe the question. Probably, I would think so, yeah. Um, it takes a toll on you. The first yeah. couple of weeks, I was like, am I even going to keep this dog? Um, yeah. Because this is going to be a lot. Like, it's way more than I thought it was going to be. And I have to really be prepared to either give him back now or just do it. Um, yeah. Because I'm going to get attached. Yeah. And That's like, yeah, you can't kill the dog later. And really at any point. But for me, I was like, I either have to give him back now mm -hmm. or just continue on. And like, what other person would want this dog? You know, everyone yeah. wants a nice puppy that's easy that they could take for a walk and Orbit's just not it. <laughs> yeah, so, he, just, he needs more than that. He needs more than that. And I would say reaching out to a professional sooner rather than later can be helpful mm -hmm. because um, especially with puppies where you might still have some of the plasticity in their brain, depending mm -hmm. on how old the puppy is. Werby was 13 weeks old, so a little bit of an older puppy, right? Yeah. Not really old, but um, it's kind of good to start getting in there before they have solidified their opinions about the world. Mm -hmm. um, but also, you know, it's not something that's going to be resolved in four sessions once a week. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're no, the, it's long not. Game. the long game, which means like virtual sessions, um, maybe a few weeks in between sessions with check ins with your professional and um, getting 
a veterinary professional on board. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I would even say like, if you're even kind of thinking about that of like, oh, well, maybe, you know, maybe I need to be calling a professional in here. Like there's not really a whole lot of harm in doing it if you can, right? Because I know it's, it can be expensive. It can be difficult to find a good one, but a good quality professional, like if you're a dog savvy person and they think that you're doing a good job with your dog, like they're going to tell you that, you know, and it'll at least be a bigger, you know, relief for you to be like, okay, well, at least I know I'm on the right track with this. And I'm kind of like working towards where I'm supposed to be going, you know? So I always think like, it doesn't hurt, you know, it never really hurts. Even if you're like, I'm not sure if this issue is concerning enough at all to be hiring a trainer for like, you know, catch it on the front end, catch it whenever it's not a big deal. And then don't wait for it to be a big deal and for you to have like tried a bunch of different things and potentially made it worse even by accident. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But like a good pro is going to tell you if you're on the right track. So that's always mm -hmm. nice to have that reassurance. Um, okay. So next question that I have for you on my list. So did you ever notice that his needs changed as he grew from a puppy to an adolescent? I know he's a little bit older now and we're kind of out of that puppyhood stage and he's still a young adult, but <laughs> he's not old yet. But um, just while you were kind of seeing that developmental change in him, I know a lot of us see whenever we have like really young puppies going into an adolescence, there's a lot of kind of somewhat normal behavior changes. Was there anything that you did in particular for him or anything that he needed extra as he kind of went from puppyhood into adolescence. I will say the one good thing about Orby is he's been the same since I've oh, gotten great. there. Fabulous. There so <laughs> because he was already a reactive dog. He already mm -hmm. had feelings that he was going to express loudly about yeah. the world. It's not like he was a quiet puppy that all of a sudden was yeah. going to, you know what? I'm going to say something about this already now knew. that I'm yeah. <laughs> is that he has literally been the same dog mm -hmm. this whole time. So okay. no surprises in adolescence. He's just, he's been the same Orby. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, honestly, that's kind of a nice thing. Cause you're like, okay, right. well, I know what I've got and this is just how it's going to be. And we can just keep going from here without any weird adolescent stuff getting mm -hmm. in the way. Exactly. <laughs> um, have you ever noticed, and this is something I feel like I've noted, thankfully, we've we're kind of in a decent place now but of course you know there's always something that happens um but have you ever noticed that advocating for him as a small dog is any different especially because like he probably has some space needs and he's not you know the type of dog that you want just anybody running up and putting hands on um if he's you know any different in terms of advocating for him than a larger dog with really similar training needs because i know you've kind of had dogs of different sizes. So you've kind of experienced both ends of that spectrum. Yeah, absolutely. So Orby's bubble is huge. So yeah. you know, if you see me and Orby out in the world, we're already turning around, first of all. Yeah. But you know, <laughs> Orby, he does bring out a certain like nostalgia feeling in a certain mm -hmm. group of people, usually older, who are like, oh, I've had a Terrier or I've had a Jack Russell. Yeah. But like he, there's a certain type of people that like him and are drawn mm -hmm. to him. Um, and, and luckily, adorable, so, yeah. <laughs> um, luckily yeah. whenever we are out with people or we're out in the world, we're out with a friend mm -hmm. and, um, a social dog who, and they just like get in between us and, you know, they're like, oh, that one's not friendly. You can say hi to this dog. Mm -hmm. Their dogs don't really want to be pet, but like they can do tricks. I don't they know. Can, yeah. At least yeah. <laughs> like Orby. So me and Orby can kind of sit back mm -hmm. and, you know, just let them know that he's, he's not a friendly dog and he doesn't yeah. get off friendly vibes. He's not like all wiggly and pulling towards people. Mm -hmm. Like he's, they appear standoffish. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, luckily no one is trying to like reach for him or do, or like pick him up or do anything weird because he is small. Yeah. That's, that's super nice. Um, do you ever notice that anybody ever makes any kind of like comments towards you or anything, or do they kind of, I feel like you probably, you probably do a pretty good job of like advocating for him. So I don't know if you have this many run-ins or not. I used to be a really bad people pleaser. And so like, even if Phoebe's at the end of the leash, like she was barking, she was going feral at them or whatever it was. I was like, I was like, ah, oh, you know, oh, sorry. Like not 
you know, stepping up like I needed to. Um, do you ever get comments like that from people at all? I mean, I've gotten comments from people yeah. and they are going to vary between, like, some people are going to look at Orby and think he's just a typical unsocialized small dog because yeah. um, I didn't do him justice or or, or whatever people kind of assume about mm -hmm. small dogs. Um, and then there are, like, a lot of people who seem to think that terriers are not friendly anyways, which is Oh, weird. really? So, like, yeah, interesting. Or like, doesn't like people, and they're like, well, terriers don't really like people, and I'm like, okay um, so there are a <laughs> well, lot of not people. true but like i guess this helps my case right now so a lot of people just like yeah. use his behavior because he's a small terrier uh -huh. and, and luckily these days they're not seeing him like yell at people they're you know they're, if he's yelling it's usually at a squirrel and that is funny so yeah. you know <laughs> I mean, people can laugh at that all they want <laughs> yeah like it's kind of what he's supposed to do so yeah. <laughs> um so if you were to give any kind of top tips to anybody who's out there who either may in the future get a puppy that ended up needing more from them than they anticipated or they already have kind of a puppy or a young dog who's struggling showing signs of fearful behavior showing showing signs of reactivity any of that kind of stuff um what would you say to them as just like top general advice mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, number one is, like, don't put medication as a last resort. I'm not saying yeah. all of these dogs will need medication, yeah, but sure. I feel like it deserves the conversation between you and your vet mm -hmm. or you and a vet behaviorist, which I know are expensive. But, you know, people have feelings about medication and then mm -hmm. extra feelings about medicating puppies. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it's hard to have that conversation. I had the conversation with my primary vet. Mm -hmm. who um has an interest in behavior and she said i will not medicate him before he's one years old which i respect yeah. that opinion and then i sought other advice from veterinary behaviors because i felt like we're never gonna make it to one <laughs> like, yeah like this is that's so far from now <laughs> yeah. so far from now yeah and uh and he used to like bark at benches at logs like mm -hmm. he used to be reactive at nothing like spinning yeah end of his leash reactive like he was just so afraid um so you know medication isn't a last resort it's not always a first resort with mm -hmm. orby it was we wouldn't have been able to do anything without figuring out medication first yeah. the first thing we tried is prozac which is be you know what any vet is kind of the generic try, yeah and what my vet would have tried at one but that didn't work so we had to go and try another medication so yeah. we would have been so far behind if we would have waited and and he potentially would have made even more negative associations about the world so yeah number one is just have that conversation with your vet and see what they think it can be hard yeah. to have the conversation it can be hard to ask it can be hard to get shot down but you know at least asking <laughs> to see yeah, if it's at least having a conversation with them um, um, so that would be kind of number one yeah and, and that's um, usually one of those things where like if you feel like your vet's not hearing you, like just go to another vet. <laughs> There's a, same thing with dog trainers. Like if you feel like your dog trainer's not really understanding you or getting where you where you want to go, you can find another one. Yeah. Um, it's your dog. I feel like they're very similar in that sense. <laughs> just go to a different one. Yeah, just another one. It's fine to get a second opinion. I mean, it's yeah. your dog. You're the one who's living with it, so mm -hmm. you can get a second opinion. Get a second opinion, and just you know, also know that these things are not going to be changed quickly a mm -hmm. lot. Um, they won't grow out of it. I've had a lot of consults myself where owners were asking, do you think he'll just grow out of it? Yeah. Well, I mean, maturity does a lot, but I wouldn't just do nothing and think my dog's going to grow out of fearful behavior because yeah. they probably will. <laughs> yeah. It could just get so much worse. I actually, I hear that a lot. I'm glad you brought that up. I hear that a lot from a lot of people where they're like, oh, well, you know, I wasn't sure. And of course, like, it makes sense. And you're like, you're just thinking, oh, you know, they're just, they're very little. This is something that, you know, they don't know a whole lot about the world. So once they kind of see that the world is safe, they're going to feel better about it. But it's, you know, sometimes it's deeper than that. Sometimes it's not just, oh, we need more experience. It's, it's who they are. Right. Yeah. yeah. Your puppy probably doesn't need to meet people if it's mm -hmm. fearful of people. That'd be the other thing. Like, don't. Yeah. 
your puppy to go say hi. Don't have strangers be giving them treats because the dog's going to be conflicted. You'll see a lot of stretchy mm -hmm. back legs or you'll just see more reactive behavior. Luckily, I you know, knew to never put Orby in those situations. He would have mm -hmm. been so much worse if he would have been pressured into situations and yeah. learned that most situations with people are not very pressury, you know, because I'm not telling him, oh, it's okay, go say hi, look, see, the person is safe. I'm just yeah. like, well, we're going this way. <laughs> you can turn yeah. right around. You, you don't have to feel good if it's scary. We're yeah. Gonna, we're just going to move away because yeah. I want him to know that he can move away because he wants to like move towards like his mm -hmm. initial reaction is to charge people. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't want him growing up to people. <laughs> yeah. Like not necessarily desirable. So let's do the opposite of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So that's something you normally don't recommend, right? Like if, if you have a dog and you're like, oh, they're afraid of people, I'll just give everybody a bunch of treats and have them feed the treats to the puppy um, without, and obviously of course with the caveat of every single dog's an individual and every single dog is not going to respond to the same process. Uh, do you have anything that you would say just kind of generally that you would suggest dog owners do instead of that. So instead of the mindset being like, get them closer to the person, get them to interact with the person or the thing that's scaring them, whatever it is, right? Like just have them get kind of in its face and see that it's not scary. What would you say to do instead of that? Just kind of generally, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> you know, distance is just going to be probably better and, yeah. and not like initially have the end result that you want interaction. I mean, mm -hmm. some training plans, the end result is interaction for certain things. But yeah. in most cases, when you're out there walking your dog, any dog, a normal mm -hmm. dog, um, a non-reactive dog, yeah. you're not saying hi to everyone. Like you're not, you know, saying hi, like people are just passing, your dog is passing. And that's kind of what you want the norm to be, mm -hmm. that we're not out here to say hi to everything or yeah. tell to have off. <laughs> yeah, it's just kind of like this is just part of the environment that we're walking past and it's not a big deal. It's not really any of your business. Right. That's kind of what I like. Business. I like to think of it. It's like it's not your business. It's not and I business. literally have yeah. a cue for Orby that says uh -huh. that I say that's none of your business. Oh, and do you really? <laughs> I love that. I like it a lot because it's just like this isn't this doesn't concern you, you know. <laughs> Right. And most funny. things do not concern Orby. 99% yeah. of things do not concern him when he's in the world. So yeah. it's kind of showing your dog, no matter who your dog is, that, that like, the, there's most of the things that have nothing to do with you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so you're kind of thinking more so, I want distance. I want just kind of a neutral response. I don't want my dog necessarily having to think about the pressure of directly interacting with the other dog, it's more so I just want this to become part of the environment. It's something that you can just kind of dismiss and move on from. Yeah, because yeah. if they're putting put in a lot of pressure situations, yeah. then um, they'll start to predict it. One thing with Orby is that, um, unfortunately, I've walked him on some narrow pathways, which yeah. is not good for me. <laughs> so now he knows narrow pathways are a little bit icky because if there's a person there, he's going to have to mm -hmm. pass them in close proximity. Yeah. Um, so the learning history of a dog will make them get upset like sooner in the sequence. Mm -hmm. Like Orby might not even walk into a trail because there's not enough space. Yeah. <laughs> and he's just, I'm not doing this. Yeah. This is too much. Um, actually, that makes me think of another question. Um, it's not on my list, but I'm just thinking about it now. Do you have any kind of suggestions of ways to kind of find, obviously people, again, this is one of those things where it varies on the individual, like your training plan, what your dog can handle, what your dog can't handle is going to be extremely individualistic depending on the dog. But if you're generally taking a dog out and you kind of want to get them either their walks, you want to get them their exercise, whatever it is, are there general things that you look for whenever you're trying to find a place where you can walk orbit that is more so going to be like a little bit safer in terms of not being super trigger heavy or like have those tight spaces? Are there like other kind of non-conventional places you normally take him? His favorite place is a college campus. Um, yeah. So it's, it's so wide open and the possibilities are endless, right? Like yeah. he could go in any direction he chooses and he'll even so seek nice. out like the wider oh, like campus is wide but he'll seek out the wider parts of campus and yeah to be, like in a big clearing 
Um, and so places that are very, very wide open, not mm -hmm. just on a designated path, um, are, are going to be helpful. So like a college campus, Mm -hmm. when like off times or very early because college kids sleep in yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> that's true that's nice to have or a pet friendly cemetery so uh -huh. places that are very 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 wide open some parks are very wide open um you know like parks where maybe they have soccer mm -hmm. sometimes or or baseball but it's not a time when they're doing that so yeah probably places that are more wide open where your dog can see like you're not trapped here you're on a six mm -hmm. foot leaf, but but there's so many options right yeah, now. Yeah, like there's so much space <laughs> we can take as we need it. Yeah, that's really nice. I like that. Um, and so you're not normally the person to be like, I'm gonna go to my favorite walking spot or one of the more populated walking paths or like necessarily around your neighborhood. You're looking for wide open spaces, quiet spaces, places where you can make as much room as you need. Um, yeah. I really like that a lot. Uh, so that actually makes me think about like some of the places I like to take mine as if I have more open space, I feel a lot more comfortable kind of like letting them get farther away from me. Cause I'm like, oh, I can see so many things coming from so far away that I can like have a plan in place way before it gets to a point where we're even going to be interacting at all. And like, usually I'm the one that sees it before they do, which is even better. So yeah. I really like that a lot. Yeah. Um, any other places that you normally suggest for walking or is it more so just look for big wide open space places where you can kind of make space for yourself as you need it big wide open spaces yeah, yeah. I mean, it's gonna okay. be dependent on the dog you know yeah or, i would love to walk orby in the woods even a woods yeah. with a big clearing but he thinks a college camp is a little, like the yeah. most fun place <laughs> i love that though <laughs> yeah i would love to take him to the woods and yeah he He'll go with other dogs and feel confident um but you know passing people is hard mm -hmm. even on wider trails so yeah i mean he really likes to be on a college campus yeah that's so nice that you have that so kind of pick pick a <laughs> spot that you know is kind of safe and trusted and just let that be where they can kind of let loose um i've even noticed too like sometimes i'll have people who have or like clients who have dogs that are kind of fearful or maybe reactive or have certain things that they're not really okay with. They'll almost tell me like, sometimes if I bring them to this really busy place, so like say they're really suspicious of people they don't know, like seeing people they don't know out on walks. If I bring them to, you know, which in Atlanta, the belt line is this really populated walking path, right? I bring it to the belt line, there's hundreds of people out and they're totally fine. And then I am walking them in the neighborhood or I'm walking them in a park and somebody suddenly appears in the distance and they're not fine. And like, I would even argue your dog probably wasn't fine at the belt line. There was probably just so much happening that they couldn't really focus on one specific thing to have that big reaction to. But if you kind of start talking about their body language, how they were responding to things that they normally respond to, if they were taking food, all that kind of stuff, you kind of see a little bit of a different picture. Um, I think that ever happened to you at all or well it's funny you mentioned um, that because I do feel like yeah. there, there's obviously a difference between like flooding your dog and a yeah. dog who's really bothered by sudden environmental contrast where mm -hmm. there's constantly things in the environment and it's not changing that maybe they do feel better yeah or can adjust you mm -hmm. know um I do notice that with Orby with um like when I took him to fast cat like there's yeah dogs everywhere and he loves dogs he's very reactive to dogs more reactive to dogs than people because he just really likes them but yeah. because <laughs> dogs everywhere and they weren't kind of like popping out like he did mm -hmm. kind of settle down a yeah little bit here and i didn't feel like he was flooded with it you know it was just like oh okay well nothing's really popping out and changing it's not yeah like, so it's all just this is just my environment that i'm in now people but you really have to be careful yeah. with that <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Like, you kind of have to you're you have to make sure you're not teetering a line into something else. But mm -hmm. um okay, I know I'm I'm asking you more questions than we talked about, but one more question that I have. Do you notice anything uh different with him because I know you are starting to get him into kind of some different sports and things like that? Is there anything different with him that you do whenever you're getting him into sports that you would say maybe like a more social or a less fearful dog wouldn't need or are you kind of noticing at this point that he's 
you know, kind of okay. He's a little bit more, I don't like to use the word, but like for lack of a better word, quote unquote, normal, right? <laughs> um. So, you know, Orby, he, he needs like a distraction probably. Yeah. You know, it's more like management in the form of like, you know how to heal, you know how mm-hmm. to put your blinders on and look at me, you know how yeah. to play tug with this toy um, mm-hmm. to kind of get us through this environment instead of doing nothing. Like if I had a- Yeah, um, just like letting him play. Yeah. yeah I just walk them onto the fast cat field, you know? Yeah. You wouldn't have to be distracting them with chicken nuggets or their mm-hmm. favorite ball. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the favorite thing. So that, because it's not a training scenario. We're, you know, mm-hmm. already there. It's just right into management mode and stuff that we've practiced before. Yeah. But, you know, much more management than I would put on any other dog. Yeah. So just kind of keeping him engaged with you and everything. And mm-hmm. key being you've practiced the management a lot in easier context before you needed it in that kind of context. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And his go-to uh, right now is when he's really overwhelmed, like mm-hmm. he will just kind of heal and look at me. Like he oh, walks in yeah. the curb because he's looking up at me and, <laughs> and he's doing it and he's eating treats yeah. and he practice like the one, two, three pattern game. And uh-huh. it can get us like out of tricky situations, but also he's not doing it like, like how he does it in the yard necessarily. Yeah. He's kind of doing it, like manically, like he, he'll have like a wild look in his eyes and he'll be like, this is all I know how to do right he's now. Like, Help me. Like, yeah. Like, I'm so overwhelmed. All of this is yeah. all I can do. I love that, but it's almost like it's because it's like become a habit. It's like if I don't know what else to do, here's this like safe, appropriate thing that I'm able to do. And it's not the worst thing because he yeah. can do so many other things in his yeah. manic state, but it's like he'll like get this crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love him so much. Um, do you have any big plans for Orbit in the future that we haven't gotten into yet? Anything else that you're planning on getting into with him? With Orby at this time, I would say right now we're having a little bit of a plateau with yeah. his progress for a number of reasons. There's been rain. Um, mm-hmm. We haven't been able to use my yard because there's cherries all over the yard that he wants to eat. Um, both like of his helper specific. dogs have yeah. been busy. Um, <laughs> and um, he's just been like more on edge. And yeah. um, I think at this time, point will probably like step away from like dog sports because mm-hmm. he's not a sport dog you know he loves yeah. fast cat but he only gets to do it twice for eight seconds and yeah he's becoming really hard to catch because he knows he only gets two so yeah <laughs> at this time we'll probably yeah step away from like any sports uh-huh. besides can across which we can just do with our buddies and just like running and yeah. trying to pull more into a harness yeah <laughs> And also, you know, we do have plans to get him like a permanent buddy, like a puppy. So that's going to be the next big thing for Orby because I feel like at this point we've made so much progress where I feel like his bad habits might not rub off onto another dog. You know, I can be very careful. It's, you know, anything's risky, but I feel like a daily companion at this point is really going to be what's going to give us more progress mm-hmm. and i'm not saying get a dog for your dog yeah. but for, maybe for sometimes where i am with orby <laughs> i yeah. feel like that is his next step and i've discussed it with other professionals and his vet behaviorist and everyone agrees this is the next step and everyone wants a puppy so yeah oh yeah trust me i'm <laughs> living that life adjacently through my friend at the moment um do you have a timeline for that or is that kind of a secret not really a secret. I mean, I'm on a list for a beagle puppy and she said she's like breeding the dog now. So like, hopefully I'll have a puppy out of this breeding if it's successful. So hopefully I don't know. I love beagle puppies so much. I'm so excited about that. (laughs) Um, Okay. I loved this talk. Is there anywhere that you want anybody who is watching or is going to watch the recording of this to find you if they want to kind of keep up with what you and orbit are up to and maybe beagle puppy 
and make yeah. probably <laughs> our TikTok. You know, okay. it's not always a lot of training videos. It's not like our walks. I don't put a lot of training content on there unless we're like in our yard or doing tricks or he's just like barking at a squirrel. Yeah, um, but it's all cute though. <laughs> I mean, it's he all good content. A lot of yeah. What he does <laughs> on our TikTok, and I think our name is Orbit underscore. Obviously, I think that's who we that are. That sounds right. And maybe if you I type in Robin Orbit, it'll pop up. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, either one of those, it should pop up. We can, I'll post a link to your TikTok in the comments too, that people can find too. Um, well, I really enjoyed this. This was lovely. I can tell you I personally love keeping up with what you guys are doing because it just seems like a lot of fun and I can tell that you have so much love for him and so much commitment for him so I'm super happy we got to talk about it today um and I hope that excuse me my dogs are snarking at each other um I hope that we can hopefully see what happens next in the orbit saga with new puppy soon as well me too next big thing <laughs> Um, all right. Well, I will talk to you guys later and tune in for our next live. I'm not sure when it'll be, but hopefully it'll be sometime soon. Um, you guys will see it in the group at some point, but, uh, talk to you guys soon. See y'all later. Bye-bye. Thanks.